as, um, as many of you must know by now, um, Wolfgang Meyer couldn't make it today. Uh, he, couldn't make the, he couldn't make the flight because he has some problems with his back. It may be a slip disc, I'm not sure, but he definitely had serious back pain and was absolutely unable to fly. So um, Mike Anderson and I have his slides, and um, he will make some efforts to say what he wants to say. So I should say at least one word or two about Deppert, I'll say more as opposed to none, but Deppert was, was a man I admired for many, many reasons, and, uh, and a man whose friendship I cherish very much. So it's for me an honor to be able to talk about his work, um, which is one of, the ways, one of the ways in which I admire him greatly. <laughs> Okay, so this is going to be a review of a lot of, it's in some sense a review of the work of Bethel Kermol, but it's also, um, because of the majesty of his work, a, a, a review of much of Romanian geometry in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and maybe the story to do with Bethel began back in the, in the decade between 1950 and 1960, when a famous uh, Spear theorem was proved. It was first done by Rausch and then um, Klingenberg and Berger uh, got a really nice form of it. And um, so the statement is quite simple. If you have a if you have a compact manifold which is simply connected, the sectional curvature is um, with a metric on it. The sectional curvature is strictly one quarter pinched. Then that manifold is homeomorphic to the sphere. And um, so now, of course, being one quarter pinched can be made scale invariant. Um, if you multiply metric by a constant, the, the curvature gets multiplied by one over that constant. So one can look at the, the, uh, the ratio between the minimum and the maximum of sectional curvatures over the manifold and call that the pinching number. And one says that the manifold is delta pinched if that number is strictly greater than delta, and it's weakly delta pinched if it's greater than or equal to delta. All right, um, I don't know what Wolfgang wanted to say about the lecture notes of uh, from all Klingenberg and Meyer. I will <laughs> let you imagine. Konkika and German. What? Konkika and German. French and German. Yeah, it was definitely, uh, uh, yeah, it was true here too. Um, Can I have the light, please? So. Uh, I look at this audience and there's nobody here that I can see who isn't pretty aware of um, most of what I'm about to say. But one thing you may not be so, not all of you may be aware of, is what the Grimold groups are. And so I thought I'd say a little bit about this. Um, so so there is this, you know, Carver and Milner define these groups of exotic spheres, which you get by taking two standard disks and gluing them along the boundary by a diffeomorphism of, of the sphere. Okay, so the picture is something like this. You have a, you have a disk and another disk, and you put a collar on the boundary, and then you, this is SN minus 1, and then you, you glue one side to the other by an exotic diffeomorphism. In particular, it should be a diffeomorphism which is not isotopic to the identity. Because the, the, the diffeomorphism type of the manifold you get only depends on the isotopy class of this attaching map. Okay, so it kind of de depends only on the class of the, of the attaching map in pi naught of if SN. But now Detlef, in his thesis, realized that there's more than one way to carve a turkey. And so he, um, he said, well, as we all know, you can, you can decompose the standard sphere in a very natural way as a union of two solid uh, tori. And then 
side here you have an SP, and inside here you have a Q sphere, and so there's a little disc like this, a normal disc, um, which is a D3 plus 1. And here you get a normal, here you get solid disk, which is a D Q plus 1. And the whole thing glues together to give you the sphere as P plus Q plus 1. Okay? In, in a standard way. So in the three sphere, for example, you take two great circles and they decompose as like this. And now, what that would realize was that if you take, I hope you can see it over there. You take an element, which is a, a map um, from the Q sphere into diffeomorphisms of the P sphere. Okay. And then and then you can take SQ what is it? S, SQ plus D. P plus 1 union with D P plus 1 plus SP, and you glue them together with this map. And you get a manifold of dimension P plus Q plus 1. And again, it only really depends on the homotopy class of this map. So this depends only on an element in the, in the Q homotopy group, the diffeomorphism group. Now, the interesting thing is that, that and then this turns out again to be a sphere, a homeomorphic to a sphere. And um, the interesting thing is that if you have, is that you can somehow undo this. Let's see if I can find a way of saying this. So if you have a map from x, y goes to x, y, or? I'm sorry, yeah. x, y goes to x, x, y goes to x, f to x. And, well, maybe I don't really have time to say how this goes, but it's not difficult to see that, that if you have a... Well, let me just draw a picture for this. So here's the... Here's the, the, um, the Q-sphere. And I have this map into the diffeomorphism group. I can assume that it's constant along this entire um, latitude. Okay? And this is a base map, so all of this goes to the identity in, in, the, in the diffeomorphism group. And now... I want to look at at these spheres that are perpendicular to this. And oh, I'm sorry, I want to make this a uh, yeah, I want to make this a whole um, I guess SQ minus one. Yes, that's right. And then for, for every point in this, if this is half of the this is a DQ minus one. And so I expand this this uh, this base point to dq minus one, and then for every and then for every point here, I get a circle, uh, and so this gives me a map from dq minus one into loops on the diffeomorphism of sp, and you can, because of the way this works, this actually descends to a map of sp minus one, and from that you easily, you, you, you can you can actually construct a map into diffeomorphism of sp plus 1. Okay. So these groups are nested one in the next. And that's this filtration. That's this natural filtration. It's very pretty. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so here was the wonderful theorem that he that, that proved in his thesis was the following. There's a sequence of, of uh, constants beginning with a quarter and going to 1 as n goes to infinity, they're increasing. And he proved that if you have a simply connected uh, manifold with it, which admits a delta k pinched metric, then that's, that manifold is a sphere whose exoticness is controlled by k. In other words, it lies in the k level of the Gromov filtration. And um, I 
Now, after a while, there, there was a, this engendered a lot of interest, and there was a lot of work on the problem. And in particular, there were people who uh, eventually proved that if you just want to show that, that, the, that the metric is, that the differentiable structure is standard, in fact, you can choose a constant that's independent of dimension. And um, so that constant was, I think it was first 0.8 something, and then it got down to 0.654. And then just recently, uh, uh, Brendel and Shane <coughs> proved that you could actually uh, replace the whole thing with work. There, the technology is very different. They, they use the Ricci flow, and the idea is completely different from the comparison type arguments that, that were used by, uh, by Dell. Um, so, and nevertheless, these Grimaud groups continue to have interest. There was a paper um, <coughs> written by topologists Antonelli, Bergeli, and Kahn, where um, they, they related the Grimaud filtration to certain pairings in, in um, homotopy groups of, of orthogonal group. Nigel Hitchin used the Grimaud groups to, to construct manifolds with non-vanishing exotic A-root genus. There's this A-root genus that takes its values in uh, KO theory. Um, the invariant defined by Milner and Atia. And Hitchin used the Grimaud groups to prove that, that there were spin manifolds and in, indeed exotic spheres which did not admit metrics of positive scalar curvature. Positive scalar curvature. And, um, okay. and there was also work of Weiss that showed that um, certain exotic spheres can't be a border pitch. Okay. But that, of course, is now not a surprise, given the work of Brendel and Shane. Um, but here's a result which is extremely nice. It's the results of Grove and Wilhelm, which has to do with packing. So if you fix an integer between 1 and the dimension of a manifold, then you can talk about the, the packing radius, the packing, the Q packing radius. And so the Q packing radius is the largest radius for which you can squeeze Q balls of radius, of that radius, into the manifold. So fix an R, is it possible to find Q disjoint balls of radius R in that manifold? So it's some sort of measure of the roundness of the thing. And, um, and the result, as you can see, is that if you have a, um, a closed manifold with curvature greater than or equal to 1, and whose packing, chief packing number is bigger than pi over 4, then that manifold um, belongs to the uh, Q minus first per mole group. Nice. <coughs> Okay, so this kind of raises the natural question, is it possible to put a metric of um, non-negative sectional curvature on an exotic sphere? Um, positive sectional curvature on an exotic sphere, but we'll settle for non-negative at the moment. And the first <coughs> result in this direction, which was, a, which was a big surprise when it came out, was by Grimaud and Meyer. And what they realized was that on, on the group SP2, um, there's a natural action of the unit quaternions okay, that, that is free and such that the quotient is one of Milner's exotic seven spheres. Now that, that's the big observation because it's a, the, the, the natural bi-invariant metric on, on a lead group always has sectional curvature greater than or equal to zero, as everybody knows. And when you take the quotient by, uh, of something with curvature greater than or equal to zero by a Ramanian subversion, geodesic fibers, then the curvature goes up. Okay. And in fact, on the quotient, there was an open set where the curvature was strictly positive. And um, apparently there was also an open set um, where, it was, where it was zero, too. <laughs> so people tried to hammer away at this, at this metric. 
and going home with Eschenberg and Karen, um, managed to get the curvature on the seventh sphere to be strictly positive on an open dense set. And then quite recently, Peterson and Wilhelm have, um, have offered a proof that, um, that in fact there exists a, a metric of strictly positive exception. It's a very, very long paper. <laughs> um, OK. So on the other hand, um, there, it has been shown by Grove and Zilla that uh, there are metrics with uh, non-negative sectional curvature on all the three sphere bodies <coughs> over this over the structure group SO4. Um, over the four sphere, and that includes uh, half of Milner's exotic spheres. Okay, so this brings me to the diameter rigidity theorem of, uh, of Berger. So the original sphere theorem was quarter pitch, that is strictly quarter pitch. And what happens if you allow sectional curvature to actually have the value of one quarter? Well, it's well known that there are examples where that happens, which are not the spheres, namely the, the rank one symmetric spaces, the projective spaces over which are complex quaternion fields and also the daily projective plane. And so Berger proved in 1960 that if you have a compact simply connected manifold which is weakly one quarter pinch, then it's either homeomorphic to a sphere or isometric <coughs> to a symmetric space of rank one. Isometric. Now, the, the proof depends on, um, his, Berger's proof depended on a, an estimate of Klingenberg's the injectivity radius. I mean, under these conditions, the injectivity radius is bounded below by pi. And um, as Wolfgang says, the correct proof of this insertion was given by, uh, by Cheeger and Grimaud in 1980. Um, in, in, in odd dimensions, not in Okay, so Cheer and Grimaud gave a uh, proof of this in odd dimensions. And um, now, in fact, the Brendel, the Brendel chain where so part two of their opus uh, also recovers the, the, uh, the Berger virginity under the, under the hypothesis of pointwise weak one word. Now, if you, um, you can always rescale the metric. So you can take the condition the curvature lies between a quarter and one and replace it by uh, putting it between one and four, right, by multiplying the metric and by one half, I guess. And um, so with that, and when you, when you do that, then it turns out that, the, that the, this condition on curvature implies the injectivity radius estimate that the diameter is bigger than or equal to pi over 2. Okay, so just multiply the metric. So with that in mind, there's a theorem in 1987 of Grimaud and Grove which says that if you, if you have a uh, compact uh, Ramanian manifold, dimension bigger than or equal to 2, whose curvature is greater than or equal to 1. Okay, now we're dropping the pinching. But we're but we're retaining the diameter estimate. The diameter is bigger than or equal to pi over 2. So this is weaker, a weaker hypothesis. Then you get basically the same conclusion. So this is a nicer virginity theorem. It says that, that it's either homeomorphic to a sphere or its universal covering is, um, is actually isometric to a rank 1 symmetric space. Now in their work, they didn't quite get the Cayley projective plane. Um, and that exception was finally proved by Wilkin in 2001. Now, the, the main idea of the proof <laughs> was to um, was that they were they succeeded in constructing a, a pair of 
sort of polar sets, two compact, convex sets that were, in some sense, the, you know, the focal locus each of the other. And um, you know, this, this is what one sees in rank one symmetric spaces. So in projective space, for example, if you take a linear subspace of dimension, dimension Q, then there is this polar linear subspace of dimension n minus q minus 1. And the whole projective space looks something like a join. So if you take the normal, if you take the normal space to this one, that, that's a linear space, and it ends up, and the sphere, the unit sphere in that linear space gets mapped subjectively down onto the other projective space. And that map is usually a hot vibration. Right, so we take the, we take this, this one, we take this one projective space, look at a normal sphere, sitting in a normal space, then the, if you like the exponential map, we'll, we'll take that normal sphere, map it down subjectively onto the dual, uh, the polar linear projective space, subspace, and that map on the sphere is just the Hopf map, either in the complex or the returning out cases. So this is, so this proof begins by finding these sets and trying to prove that they are what they're supposed to be. Namely, um, so they find a pair of, of uh, convex sets A and A prime that are a maximal distance pi over 2 apart. And um, they prove that these are actually uh, actually submanifolds and that, as I say, if you take this a normal sphere and fiber uh, in, a normal, in the normal space to one of these, then it's it, it, there's a, a submersion onto, um, onto the other. So they succeeded in getting that much of the geometry. But then it, this led to a question of, um, of how to deal with uh, vibrations of the sphere, which are um, which the Romanian vibrations. And there the technology wasn't in place. And so, um, and so, Karsten and Bethel began to study the, the structure of these, um, of these, of these submersions. And um, so they they wrote a really pretty theorem, a really pretty paper in which they proved not only something about, about vibrations, okay, Romanian vibrations of spheres, but they actually looked at Romanian foliations. So if you have a, they, they studied foliations of the sphere, which had the property that locally they're defined by Romanian submersions. Locally they're defined by Romanian submersions. So this is the way you usually look at foliations, right? You look at the normal data. And um, so there they were looking at, at foliations which were locally driven by Mayan submersions and, and in low dimensions gave a beautiful classification. So if the, if the foliation has dimension one, then, uh, then it's, it actually comes from one of the standard actions of the circle, circle on the sphere where you have weights, EPI theta one, EPI theta two, uh, all times t. And if uh, dimension is two, there are none. If dimension is three, then it comes from representations of SU2 acting on the sphere. And then that put together with, uh, with work of Browder on the global, global fact of you know, vibration of, of, uh, of a sphere over projective space, then, then the fibers have to be. Well, if you, if you if, I guess if, if you just have a vibration, the sphere with the fibers are spheres, then it's then the, exactly the ones you've been on top of. And from that, they were able to classify. Them. They were able to classify them, you know, the vibrations. So it's very nice piece of work. Okay. So this brings me to the theorem I want to discuss in some detail. Uh, Say Wolfgang on this discussion, so more detail than I want. <laughs> uh, so I'll give you a little bit of history. Um, well, that look was at Berkeley between 1966 and 68 as another fellow. 
And in the first year, Wolfgang visited, and uh, they proved the uh, and they proved the theorem on uh, not on complete non-compact manifolds of positive sectional curvature. Beautiful theorem that if you have a, a complete non-compact manifold of positive sectional curvature, no other assumptions, no, not simply connected or anything, then it's diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. And um, they also did some spectacular work on, um, on uh, the closed geodesics on the, uh, which I think we will hear about later, which closed geodesics on the one in Okay, and then the next year, Jeff came to Berkeley, and, um, and he and Deva proved the Sol theorem, which was a generalization of the theorem that uh, the Grimaud and Meyer proved. And, um, and this is the theorem that asserts that if you have a complete Ramanian manifold, non compact and it has sectional curvature greater than or equal to zero, then, well, first of all, I want to say that under those hypotheses, there are lots of possibilities. Because um, you can simply take any manifold with non positive curvature across a full line. So you think product of homogeneous spaces and lead groups, whatever you like, cross it with a line, you got one of these guys. Okay, so now all of a sudden, much is possible. But what they proved is that that's more or less what happens. Namely, <coughs> any such manifold is always diffeomorphic to the normal bundle of its soul, of a soul, it's not necessarily unique. And the soul is a complete, totally convex, totally geodesic submanifold without boundary. It's embedded in there. And um, so it's also a manifold of non positive curvature, but compact. And then, it, and then what's left is a normal bundle over there. Um, The soul theorem. <clears throat> now, at the end of the paper, um, they made a conjecture that, um, that this theorem was pretty rigid, namely, if, if, um, if the soul was not a point, then, and, well, the conjecture was that if you have one of these manifolds, and at any point in the manifold, the sectional curvature is strictly positive, all the sectional curvatures at that point are positive then the soul has to reduce to a point. In other words, if the soul is, is really there, then every point has these flat directions in it, or the direction, by the direction, so it's the ex exponential map on the normal bundle of the soul. And um, that was around for quite a while. And in fact, there was a, a paper, a very long proof, 50 so odd pages, and Risha Perlman picked it up and wanted desperately to understand it. Couldn't. So he sat down and wrote his own three-page paper. <laughs> <laughs> proving it. This, this is one of his Perlman's early, early works. And the one which made all the money and geometers realize what a talent he is. Um, so, So I want to talk a bit about the main ideas for the proof of the Sol theorem. And, um, so the idea is that you want to, um, the main idea is to construct total, certain totally convex sets. So I need to tell you what a totally convex set is. A totally convex set is a subset of a Ramanian manifold with the following property. If you take any two points in that set, and any geodesic that connects those two points, that geodesic has to stay in the set. Okay. So if you think about the sphere, the only subset which is totally convex in the sphere is the whole sphere. You can always get out of any other set. Okay. Close. And so, um, so it's sort of like a big black hole. The geodesics just can't get, no geodesic between two points can ever get out of it. <laughs> As a totally convex set. It's a very strong condition. All right, now this, the notion of a ray in a Ramanian manifold, which is, which is a half infinite geodesic, every segment of which is minimizing. So you take a point, you put a ray in, a, a ray is a geodesic half line, which has the property that 
every segment is minimized. And if your manifold is non-compact, at every point you have to have a ray. Simple, simple argument. Because um, there, there has to be some sequence of points that goes to infinity, and so there are segments, minimal segments joining them, and then you can take a subsequence of initial velocity vectors to converge, and limiting geodesic will be a ray. So now, given that there are always lots of rays, Here's the construction. The construction is that you take, um, well, maybe I'll just put this up. So the construction is this. You, you take your point, as here, and you move along this geodesic ray to a point T, and then at that point, you take the ball whose radius is t. Okay, so this gives you an expanding family of balls, all of which touch the initial point of the manifold. And you take the union of these. When you take the union of these, you get a great big open set. You look at the complement of that set. That's a big closed set, which you can think of as a half space. And, and you, because you think of this as a union of balls, you tend to think of the complement as being something which is concave. The marvelous thing in positive curvature is that the complement turns out to be totally convex. Totally convex. So, and then, because you can do this at every point, you begin to track the soul. So, what's the proof that, that, that the complement is totally convex? Well, first of all, back. So the first lemma is that if you have sectional curvature, if it's manifold is complete, non-compact, non negative sectional curvature, then these half spaces that I was talking about are always totally convex. And the way you do it to begin with is the following. I mean, suppose it's not true. Okay? So then there are two points in this half space, and the geodesic between them wanders into the, into the complement. Now that complement is open, so it means it wanders into the, into one of these balls. Okay. And so, um, so that's what's being said here. You have these two endpoints, and there's some point on the geodesic joining them which actually lies inside. And now, the thing is that, so now we have this, this, this thing that we're discussing. So we can join, so we get some points inside. But then um, I claim that if you if you move further along this geodesic, the, uh, the the distance to the boundary remains bounded. In other words, if you move further along, uh, then the distance actually satisfies a uniform bound. So if you take a point t, which is bigger than t naught, and uh, now at t naught, I can I can write this distance as something as t naught minus epsilon because it's actually inside that ball for some positive number of epsilon. And then you apply the triangle inequality, and if you move along a little bit further, the distance from q to to c of t, where t is further along, is bounded by this by the triangle inequality. But the distance here is precisely equal to t minus t naught because it's a ray. Every segment is, is parameterized by arc length. And so the distance is less than or equal to t minus epsilon for all t. For all t. Uh, epsilon is important. So, okay, so now, now you look at this picture. So, so now for every t, we know that the, 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 that the distance to this geodesic is bounded um, below by um, by t minus epsilon. And we can, of course, for each t, find a point which is closest. As you move out, the point which is closest will move, but it's, it has to, it's constrained to lie on our initial geodesic segment. All right, so now one's going to apply 
the Tabernacle Triangle Theorem. And the Tabernacle Triangle Theorem, oh, by the way, because it's, because it's, uh, it's minimal, it's going to make a, a right angle. That angle is going to be pi over 2. Otherwise, it's easy to get closer. And now you apply the Tapanaga Triangle Theorem for a hinge. And the Tapanaga Triangle Theorem says that, that, that this geodesic hinge with a right angle can be compared to the same hinge in Euclidean space. Okay? But in Euclidean space, the distance between the endpoints will be fixed. fixed. Okay? So, so that's what we do. And um, so you choose a point. So you choose this point which is closest. You get that the angle is pi over 2. And, um, and then you apply Tapanaga's comparison theorem. And, and the comparison theorem tells us that here. So you can compare it. You can compare it now to the Euclidean one, and the, the standard Euclidean statement would be that um, this distance, which is um, which is bigger than or equal to t, is, is going to be less than less than or equal to c squared. That's a constant plus t minus epsilon squared. Now, if you expand t minus epsilon out, you cancel t squared, you get an immediate contradiction for large. So it's delicate. Okay. Um, I'm out of time. So let me just say that in a few words how the rest of the argument goes. And now, now for every point you have a, you have this half space. But you could also on that geodesic you can move out some distance and take the half space there. Okay, so fix, fix the distance from this point, and then for every ray you take you take the half space that, that's constructed at, at distance r. So you get all these ones at distance r away. And it's easy to see that the intersection of those half spaces is compact. It's an intersection of totally that's totally convex things, it's again totally convex. Now you've got a totally convex compact set. And, and these things are nested, so you squeeze down to the smallest one. And what you get is a nice convex, minimal, uh, totally geodesic, or totally convex set. And then step two in the whole proof is to show that that thing is a manifold with boundary. And if the boundary is bad, but inside it's a nice totally geodesic submanifold. With this kind of bad boundary, but, but, the, but it's convex. So imagine it's got a nice convex but not necessarily a smooth boundary. And the nice thing is that the dimension of that thing is smaller than the dimension of the thing you began. So then you move down to the world of this convex manifold with boundary, and you start taking, and you look at the sets which are equidistant, equidistant from the boundary. And you take, and you let them squeeze down until you get the limiting one. And that again will have this property. It would be lower dimensional, a smooth submanifold with the boundary. And you can only do this n times before you get something that has no boundary. <coughs> and that's basically it. But then you have to prove 